Good morning and welcome to this, our second meeting of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Welcome to the committee. Um, today, our first item agenda is for the committee to agree to take the last item, item four in private. This is an item where we will consider the evidence that we're about to hear um, at committee from the Ethical Standards Commissioner. Do members agree to take that last session in private? Thank you. I have agreement to that. And next, I would like to thank Ian Bruce, who is joining us today. Ian is the Acting Commissioner, and if it's all right with you, Ian, um, we had the pleasure of talking to you and reading through your report. So if it is OK, I would like just to go straight to questions, which will come from the members, uh, two of whom are remote today. And if there are any follow-up questions, the members will indicate to me and we can take it from there. But thank you for coming um, and seeing us today. So we move to the first question, which is going to come from Bob. Good morning, Bob. I'm not sure if Bob can hear us. Yes, Bob. Oh. Isn't it? <laughs> You all right, Bob? We can see you talking, Bob, but we can't hear you. All right. Yeah, no problem. Um, Bob, I'm going to pass over to Paul just to ask his questions and then Broadcast will get back to us with regard to your connection. Sorry about that. Yeah, up quicker than we thought, Paul. Yeah, over to you. Thank you, convener. Ian, and good to see you back again uh, this week. Just, I think it kind of leads on to the questions I kind of asked week and it was on around about the revisions to the code of practice, uh, supporting the improvement of uh, training and support, you know, will there, first of all, will the revisions support the improvement of training support and, and in what way do you think that would that would happen? Um, it's a good question um, and uh, good morning convener and members and thanks again for the opportunity to talk about the work of our office today um, in public, it's, it's very much appreciated. Uh, my bailiwick covers the appointments process and, and once people are in post effectively my involvement ends. That's not to say that I don't take considerable interest in the development uh, and support of board members. I, I, I certainly do. Uh, and it's also not to say that the government hasn't worked with me uh, and with other stakeholders to discuss these matters with a view to improving on the overall journey of applicants and ultimately board members once appointed. So, so I am able to provide some information on that although the extent to which the code might be prescriptive about board support, I think would be debatable from the perspective of the Scottish ministers, um, simply given the provisions of the Act uh, do restrict me to, to the appointments process itself. Um, it may be helpful to give you some information on the sorts of activities that are currently underway um, and, and where we dovetail with those. Um, so. The Scottish Ministers have established, and this is for some years now, uh, new board member induction events, and those take place three times a year. Um, currently they are being held online, um, previously obviously in, in person, and I anticipate in due course a return to that, um, but online at the moment. Um, so new board members and chairs um, receive a presentation from a minister to talk about the aspirations of the government for four boards and the way in which they ought to work. They uh, receive a talk from a representative from Audit Scotland. Uh, clearly that's to discuss governance on boards, financial accountability. Um, they also receive a talk from me. Um, at our next one, I've agreed that we will run our talk jointly with the Standards Commission for Scotland. And in that case, we talk about um, the code of conduct for members and the ethical standards that they are expected to adhere to. They also get talks from sponsors and they provide the direct link between ministers and boards. 
the public appointments team and the public bodies unit. Uh, now, the public bodies unit centrally has responsibility for the sorts of activities that, that, that you've expressed an interest in. They have created a governance hub for members with a private area. Uh, there are resources on that hub as well. They cover things like succession planning, for example. Um, and over and above that, um, so I, I'm also a member of a uh, steering group for NHS improvement. Uh, and although its remit is wider and does encompass the, the topic that you've asked about, as well as appointments, um, the activity there was um, discussed just recently at a meeting this week, and the Public Bodies Unit came along to talk about what they're engaged in at the moment, um, and, and, and that's around increasing board members and chairs' understanding of diversity and the difference that that makes to the governance of boards, a very important topic. Um, how did that arise? So our own office, the Scottish Government, and Inclusion Scotland. So that's, that's an organisation that represents disabled people. Yeah. We worked together on a project for disabled people who had an interest in becoming board members. That was a two-way street, so the government and boards themselves, because they, they shadowed current boards, learned a great deal about the experience of disabled people and how they might adapt their practices in order to be more inclusive. So training on the back of that is now going to be rolled out. We just heard about that this week. I'm sure the Public Bodies Unit would be more than happy to provide more information and I'd be happy to provide contact details. And thanks for that. Can you just, uh, just a supplementary mm. on that? Please do. Is there a formal process in place in regards to new board members giving feedback on, on their induction and on their ongoing training? Is there, a, is there a stage after three months, six months, a year where they can feedback on? And obviously, if, 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 if the feedback is positive or negative, can that then be amended or changed? I'm just wondering if there is a formal process where board members have the opportunity to do Yes. Um, so, so that's a very good point, and I think the code potentially is engaged there. Um, so what we anticipate is that members should not be reappointed unless they you know, can demonstrate that they've not only got the skills, knowledge, experience, etc., that are required by the board at the time, but also that their performance has been effective. And that is something that we've audited previously um, and actually established that practices were quite good in that area. If you felt the code could or should be more prescriptive in that area, then that's certainly something for, for you to consider. Um, when, when coming to a decision about responding to the consultation. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that. I just wonder at this stage, I understand that um, the sound is back up and running. And if I was to go back to Bob, um, for those who are watching, it may give a more um, holistic picture of what we're talking about, uh, although we are, of course, aware of it. So um, with trepidation, over to you, Bob. Can you hear us, Bob? We can't hear you. <laughs> he can hear us, but we can't. That's all right. We are clearly having technical difficulties. Um, not stepping on your toes, Bob. <laughs> Ian, can I ask you, I mean, we are today discussing the revised code of practice and indeed our response to it. Um, and one of the purposes of the, the, the Code of Practice is obviously to hold ministers to account, but without stifling um, innovation <coughs> through over-prescription. And there was been, there's a lot of discussion in the, in, the, in the Code and the accompanying notes about that over-prescription. Um, would you like to explain um, that to us and, more importantly, your view of how the Code got to its recommendation, which does seem to be opposed by some people. Um, so is there a particular recommendation that, that is of concern? Well, it's really just a generic question about whether or not the revised Code of Practice um, can successfully hold ministers to account, but counterbalanced by the fact that the, 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 the complaint about it was that if it was over-prescriptive, it wouldn't work. Um, so I'm happy to take 
that view on the chin. Um, but equally, if, if you have a look at the analysis of responses, it's clear that something had to change. I, I said this to the committee previously, and I'm happy to put it on the record again. I think this administration has done very well in respect of public appointments. Um, the achievement of gender parity on boards, you know, that's that's an incredible thing to have achieved, and, and, and that's great. But but there are areas in which no progress or very little progress is made. It's, it's terribly incremental, and in some cases we've gone backwards on occasion. So practices as they stand have not led to our meeting our joint aspirations. Um, you spoke about holding the government to account, and I think that's that's right and proper. A proportion of what I see on appointment rounds, uh, and I say I, but, but I'm talking about the advisors that I allocate and who report mm -hmm. to me, um, doesn't represent good practice. Yes, they meet the code's requirements, but it's not good practice. And we know, and the government knows, that it's capable of exceptionally good practice. We've got lots of case studies on our website that demonstrate that the government does do that. Um, so, so I do understand and accept that there's an argument that you know the code shouldn't be prescriptive, but I believe that the provisions that I've included in it, which is about evidence-based decision-making and ensuring that good practice is used on each occasion, will actually make a difference, because I see it making a difference on a round-by-round round basis. It's also worth saying that it's possible for the Commissioner to um, not set aside, but, but to relax any provision in the Code. So that's built into the Code itself. So if Ministers want to take a particular approach that they believe is innovative, but that currently isn't covered by the practices or would appear to be precluded, as long as it's compatible with the principles, I am more than happy to set that particular provision aside. And you will see from my annual reports that I do that on a very frequent basis. I am pragmatic, very pragmatic, and I, I have encouraged innovation alongside my advisors for years and years. So there is nothing in the code from my perspective that actually precludes the Scottish ministers innovating. And if they have any ideas um, that are compatible with the code, I'd be more than happy to consider them um, and, um, and set aside the provisions as I've done historically and my predecessor has done historically. So do you feel that the criticism of being over-prescriptive over is unfair because the code within its own confines allows for innovative thinking and actually, as you say, it is based on the on, on the very foundations of the code, getting the, the, the right person in the right place and the code would allow that to happen? I, I, would, I would suggest that it is already incredibly flexible. Yeah. Um, and, and I would go further than that. Um, the code encourages innovation and good practice as well as enabling it. Um, so where I've gone further on this occasion it is about them having plans, and it's, it's about having plans for individual appointment rounds. It's about having plans nationally. And for all of that to end up in the public domain, I've, the committee will be aware that I'm particularly interested to know what they would like to see in order to give assurance to the committee and to the wider public that the government's plans are sensible, that they're smart, that they're achievable, that they will achieve their objectives, and where they don't work. We need to be made aware of that as well. Um, you know, simply my annual reporting, I don't think is sufficient, sufficient. at the current time. Yep. I'm grateful for that comment. I don't know whether you're back with us, Bob. No, I'm afraid not. Then I will. I will push. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Um, oh, hello, Bob. <laughs> Excellent. We're up to question two. I'm not sure how much you've managed to hear. Well, the boys, you know, first of all. Uh, Whilst I'm not responsible for the IT, my apologies for the, the, the inconvenience uh, to, to, to fellow members and the Commissioner, of course, giving evidence. Um, I, I think I heard, heard you, Convener, asking something I had begun to raise about that conflict between being prescriptive to achieve good outcomes in relation to diversity and ensure best practice is emanated and the flexibility and innovation that government had said that was wanted. But I think you've got some good stuff on the record in relation to that convener, so no need for me to 
to, to, to ask about that. I think that's what was picking up in the kind of the, the, the bits of sound that I had been getting. Um, the other question, the follow up question had, had been, and I'll just ask it to put it on the record, is will the revised code help with finding a balance between achieving diversity? Because we want to see that diversity, of course, eh, Commissioner, but ensuring that the board retain the range of essential skills. It has to be a diversity of you know, protecting characteristics. Really good to hear what you're saying about those from various income backgrounds, diversity of opinion and views, but also we need uh, the relevant skills. And again, there can be a tension between achieving that diversity and getting those relevant skills. So how do we get that balance? Yes, uh, again, a good question. I would encourage the members to think about diversity in two ways. And, and this is something, you know, it's an ongoing dialogue that we've had both with the Scottish Minister's officials and boards themselves. There are two aspects to diversity. So the first one is you were talking about the specialist skills, um, but not necessarily specialist. It, from my perspective, it's about a board's needs at a given point in time. So yes, um, different experience, different skill sets, different types of knowledge, different backgrounds, different perspectives. So that, that's you know the first aspect of diversity. The second is protected characteristics, so the demographics. Um, is there a tension between the two? Not necessarily, um, but your decision about how you're going to plan for succession has a knock-on effect for whether or not, or the way in which you're going to achieve diversity of protected characteristics. I'll use an example. So um, uh, let's say an NHS board decides, and this has been piloted recently, so it's a live example, decides that some form of digital transformation that will assist in terms of its service delivery is absolutely vital. That's the skill set that they are then going to look for in order to plan for succession. Now, the demographic of people who have that knowledge is going to be different to the general population. So immediately you're looking at what we classify as younger people. And we know that there's a dearth of younger people on boards. But the likelihood is that more people under the age of 50 are going to have that up-to-date skills, knowledge, that, that skill set in terms of digital transformation than, than over 50s. So, so when you go out, you know immediately, OK, potentially, we're going to change this board's diversity in terms of knowledge of digital transformation, but also we're going to change this board's composition, more than likely, in relation to the, the age of, of its members overall. Um, and that same argument applies each and every time you go out. Um, sometimes you'll go out for a particular skill set. Um, it might be HR related. And we know there are more women working in HR than men. So again, that has an impact. Um, certain professions do tend to be um, less diverse, for want of a better expression, in terms of demographics than others. And in that case, it's incumbent on the Scottish Government and their officials to take positive action measures. So you know if there's only a limited pool of, let's say, visible ethnic minorities within a, within a given profession, and that's the profession that you're looking to um, fill your board position from, then you need to reach out and target people who have the protected characteristics that you know are currently under-reflected. Thank you. Um, I'll, 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 I'll let other members come in there again. Sorry about the disruption at the start of the meeting. Thank you for that answer. Uh, thank you, Bob. And actually, it leads us very much into your area of interest, Paul. Yeah, it, it does. And you know, it kind of leads on to this. And you know, obviously, the, the diversity delivers uh, strategy. I think was really important. It's the first equal opportunity strategy. I think, obviously, about the ministerial appointments. And I understand it needs a, a change to primary legislation. I'm just wondering what what that would entail, what the process would be? Uh, yes, I, I think relatively straightforward. So it, it would be for the government to bring forward, and it would be for, um, well, this is the subject committee and, and this subject committee to consider. There are already provisions. So we're talking today about revision to the code of practice. There are already very straightforward provisions in the Act that say the commissioner is to keep the code under review, and the commissioner may, from time to time, revise the code 
subject to consultation and approval by ministers of the parliament. There is no equivalent provision for the strategy. Okay. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I mean, I suppose moving on, talking about, you mentioned your um, annual report that comes out, but what are the advantages of placing annual planning and reporting requirements on the Scottish Government? And do you think that would be too onerous? Uh, so the Government already does this to an extent. Yeah. So the Government has currently, I think it's a three-year public appointments plan held centrally. So these are all the things that we are going to do. And I, I think, and, and I'd assume the committee would also think that the Scottish ministers would want their officials to have that in place because, you know, at the end of the day, we, we have these objectives and we know that we're not going to achieve them simply on a round-by-round -round basis. Mm -hmm. That's what Diversity Delivers told us. We did all the research, we worked alongside the government and it made recommendations about national campaigns. How much public awareness is there of these positions? Do, you know, do people really see themselves potentially in these roles? And until we're in that space and people see it as um, you know, civic participation, the potential to make a real difference to their own communities, I'm not sure we're in that space. So we, I think we would all expect the government to have these plans in place and those plans are in place. So I'm not asking them to do any more than they're already doing. What I am suggesting is that we have on the face of the code, yes, you should have these plans in place, and also that, that we should all have access to them. Mm -hmm. Everyone should have access to them. We should know what you have planned. People should have an opportunity to comment on what you have planned. Um, none of us have all the answers to everything. <laughs> And uh, I think it would be very helpful for all of that to be in the public domain. The other thing is, we've spoken earlier about the accountability of the mm. Scottish ministers. We need to know whether or not those plans have been successful. Mm. If they haven't, let's have a look at them again next year and see what you might do differently in order to achieve the objectives that you have. And as part of spreading the understanding of the role, board roles um, across Scotland's civic and beyond society, an annual publication um, would always give you the advantage of press interest um, in these events. And actually, if people understood more of what boards act or the roles on boards actually did, perhaps we would see a wider pool of people putting themselves forward. Would absolutely. That be fair? Yeah, absolutely. I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to that. Um, with fingers crossed, I'm going to come to you, Edward. Um, I think I think it's worked. I've unmuted. So good morning, Ian. I, I, I've heard you. I hope you can hear me. Um, I've got a series of questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is a really simple yes or no one. Uh, do you think there is a problem in Scotland with serial board members? No. I'm happy well, to elaborate if you'd like me to. I, I'm, I'm happy to, but maybe I can just make a comment at the moment. Uh, I looked at one person uh, yesterday, I was just doing a bit of research, obviously, as you'd expect, who has sat for 31 years on boards across uh, Scotland, uh, I think six or seven, and is currently chairing two. That would appear to be a serial board member, but um, t tell me why you don't think there's a problem here. I think there is a problem and, and the convener spoke to this just now. I think there is a problem in terms of, A, people's understanding and willingness about these board roles. Um, so, so that's about the pool of potential applicants. Uh, and, and if people aren't aware that they are going to be treated fairly and that you know there's, there's potential for them to serve, then they won't put themselves forward. So, so my role's about providing assurance and saying, no, if you do want to put yourself forward, by all means, you should apply and, and you will be treated equitably. Um, I think the issue that you've just described to me is based on something else entirely. Um, and that's about how ministers traditionally have defined merit and in some cases continue to define merit. So th these two things are interlinked. If you keep asking for the same thing, then the process will keep delivering that same thing. 
So if, if you go out and you say, I'm looking for someone with experience of chairing boards, for example, although that's that's quite unusual, but you know, it's it's a very it's a very narrow narrowly defined skill set, then the likelihood is that someone who's done that previously is going to be more successful than others who apply in competition with them. And I think that's the issue. And again, I, I know for a fact this is something that my not immediate but prior predecessor did discuss with ministers, um, and this is going back quite a few years now, about five years, and just said, look, and, and we came up with some guidance that, that has been helpful. If, if you have particular priorities for a new board and the sort of person that you want to lead that board is different to what you've been used to, then it's up to you to specify that. And you do see very different appointments on occasion for boards because that's what ministers have taken the time to do. Think of an example, um, poverty and inequality commission. So you've got the head of that commission has never held a board position previously, never mind chaired a board. But th those were the particular attributes that the minister was looking for on that occasion. Um, and, and that led to a different appointment. So, so in order to address the concern that you've raised with me, um, and ultimately, I think it's worth saying on the record as well that, that these are ministerial appointments. It's not for me to determine who should or shouldn't be appointed. It's for ministers to say, this is what I need for this board. That, you know, statutorily, that's, that's, that's their um, role. Um, and that's why I, you know, I can't say, oh, there's an issue with that, because it's up to ministers to determine what they need. But if, if you do want more diverse boards, and if you do want um, people who haven't held lots of roles previously, that's the way to address it, is ask for something different. OK, Ian, I, I, I take your explanation of why, to me, it's a very small pool, and the people in the pool keep getting picked out. In the same, I, I, I wouldn't accuse them of wanting to be serial board members. But if you've been a board member for 31 years, you know you are obviously doing something. And I can give you other examples of, of people who've morphed from, uh, I think, uh, the Deer Commission to uh, Scottish Natural Heritage to uh, Scottish Water. You know, probably um, just as one appointment expired, they seem to pop up in another one. So. Expanding the pool may be the answer, and I'm sure the convener will push on that. Uh, I have a further question to do with uh, ministerial appointment. Uh, during the last parliamentary session, is, is sorry, convener, am I all right to go on? Absolutely. Yeah, sorry, during the last parliament, I sat on various uh, committees who were given the chance to interview uh, people who were being appointed by ministers. Um, uh, I have to say that it was a... Uh, a tick box, tick box exercise. Do you have any evidence of the Parliament ever rejecting somebody? And do you think the parliamentary uh, committee system of interviewing people who are appointed by ministers is sufficiently robust to ensure that the ministers just don't shoe it, shoehorn in the person they want? That has certainly not been my experience um, at all. Uh, and I can only talk to those ministerial appointments requiring parliamentary approval that are regulated. So, so I, I don't know what your experience of this is, but um, on every occasion that a new appointment was to be made, and it was a regulated appointment, those people were interviewed absolutely by the parliamentary committee. What I have sought to do, um, and, and perhaps slightly ultra virus for me, I have engaged meaningfully and, and I'm sure Mr. Doris will, will be able to verify this, I've engaged meaningfully with every parliamentary committee because my view is that the parliament made a decision that these appointments should be subject to parliamentary approval for a reason and that wh whomsoever is appointed to those roles has to meet both ministerial but also the parliament's ambitions for the sort of person who is sought. Um, and, and so I have, I'm going to say more than encouraged, I have actively encouraged the Scottish ministers to consult meaningfully with those committees about their plans before anything ends up in the public domain about what's required for that role. 
Um, the system here operates very differently to the way in which it operates south of the border. Um, and I think it is absolutely vital that Parliament is properly consulted on these rules, which is why I've put it on the face of the code. Sorry, just, just before we move on then, and, and Kavina, my final question is, is, are you aware of any circumstances where somebody has not been approved by the committee that's, re uh, that's interviewed them? Is, I mean, one of the problems, uh, uh, Ian, is you'll appreciate that, that committees are, uh, the way they're appointed and run on the De Hond system means that there is a natural bias towards the, the, the government on all of them. So, are there any examples? Because the examples I saw in the Parliament in the last session and indeed took part in uh, were, were functionary, I would say. OK, well, I'm, I am very sorry to hear that, if that has been your experience. As I say, in terms of regulated appointments, it hasn't been mine, but I, you know, I, I don't know what goes on in private session. All I can guarantee you is that for those in which my office has been involved, the purpose of our meaningfully, and having the ministers meaningfully engage with those committees is to ensure that they have a say in the type of person that's going to be appointed. And so, in those cases, inevitably, when the best candidate is put up, I would anticipate that the committee would say, well, that's exactly what we asked for, so so why would they want to reject them? That's very different from a situation in which there isn't engagement during planning, in which case I, I, I would quite understand that a committee might say, well, you know, this is not the person we were looking for at all. but. But that's not the reality from my perspective. Thank you, Ian. I think we may agree to differ. Uh, and thank you, Convener, for bringing me in. No, no, no problem with that. Um, I suppose just to get an answer, so you're not aware of a situation where a committee has said no to a proposed appointment? Thank you. Not, not in really, again, not, just to be clear, not in relation to regulated sorry, appointments. Sorry, into the yeah. regulated, yeah. yes, yeah. to those very specific areas that, that committees involve themselves. Um, I suppose the next sort of follows because you've talked about this very small pool um, in which people go fishing uh, for board members. Are you confident that the revised code can um, uh, break that dam, uh, remove, <laughs> widen the pool? Let me put it that way. Yeah. So, uh, so the code encourages mm -hmm. and enables the practices th that will achieve the objectives that we want to achieve. Um, uh, it now includes provisions that mean that government has to be transparent, assuming that, that everyone I'm consulting agrees that this is an appropriate way forward, so that national activities can and should take place that, that will encourage a wider mm -hmm. pool of people to come forward. I cannot guarantee, in terms of the code, that any of these things are going to achieve these objectives. Um, and my powers are limited. Yeah. I, I can draft a code. It can require certain things of the Scottish ministers and their officials. Um, I monitor how they do against that, and, uh, and I then report to the committee. That's the system. Are you confident, then, that the code, the amended code, would facilitate that if the intention was there? I believe so. Yeah, Excellent. absolutely, absolutely. Well, Particularly uh, in terms of you know the, the the requirement for this this annual plan. Yeah. If we want to go further, uh, and if we want to um, ensure the likelihood of success is much higher, then I think a refresh for diversity delivers is also a requirement, and you know that would take us beyond what I've put on the face of the code. Absolutely, Bob. I understand you have a supplementary comment. Uh, convener, I think the, the, the Commissioner has probably dealt with it in his exchange with, with Mr Mountain. I was just going to put on record it might be worth seeking out the role of the Social Security Committee in the last session in relation to the appointment of poverty and inequality commissioners and, and, and just that process. But I would want to type the meeting with that, but that might give a, a real life example of not just having a tick box exercise or just jumping through the hoops, but a dynamic, uh, proactive process with, with the committee. Um, but I'd like to help anything in relation to that. No, thank you, Bob. It's certainly an example that's raised by a number of people as a fine example of how it should work. Um, and I, I think you know your, your views right, rightfully put it on the record. 
Thank you for your patience, Alexander. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Can I turn to you? Uh, Commissioner, you've, you've given a very broad view this morning of your intentions within the code and how you want to encourage uh, individuals to come forward and was to uh, be much more diverse and to take on all of that. Uh, and, I, and I do think that, that that is starting to now become reality. Uh, but I think it's also very important that we, we, we try and get the best individuals uh, and there's a good uh, calibre of candidate coming forward. Uh, but not all candidates will succeed. Uh, and when we're looking at that, those who don't make it, uh, can I ask about what you're doing within the code to, to revise that, uh, to look at uh, what happens to a candidate that doesn't go through the process and fail? Uh, are they encouraged to come back? Or what role do you have? Because you've talked today about how you're very involved in the application process. Uh, and that would be where these individuals progressed only so far. Uh, so it would be good to get a flavour from you as to what you're trying to do there and how you're going to try and revise to encourage people who have uh, to come back. Absolutely. Um, and again, it's, it's a very good point. Um, we do track how people get on in the process and we do report on that in our annual report. Um, and I think it's fair to say that for people from certain backgrounds, mm -hmm. they are less successful when they apply mm -hmm. in comparison with others. And that's an issue. Mm -hmm. Um, it is something uh, that I hope to tackle head on. Uh, I've revised the code to include a, a new principle. Um, it's, it's entitled respect, but fundamentally it's about customer care for applicants. It's about treating them respectfully for, for um, making their application, for taking the time to apply. Uh, and the intention is that they will get meaningful feedback when they have been unsuccessful about why they were unsuccessful, as opposed to a template letter. Uh, I do understand that there are resource implications for that, but I do think it's very important for people to understand why they didn't do as well as they might and what they might do differently next time in order to improve on their chances of success. And, and from that, the, the interview that may happen if a candidate is successful and goes in front of a number of individuals, but there's an application form that is normally completed as well. Uh, how supportive are you to encourage and support individuals to fill that form and to understand? I mean, I, I know from seeing them in the past, they may have a, a one question, a one line question that they're expecting to write maybe three or four hundred words on or whatever. Uh, that's the topic and that's the style. But but that style can sometimes be quite restrictive as to what individuals can and do say. So how are you planning to broaden that that whole? idea of ensuring that the application form and the interview are much more aligned because sometimes they can be quite stringent or stuffy or you know people don't feel comfortable in these kind of environments because it's seen as a uh, and, how, and how do you how do you manage to change that yes uh, again a very good question um, the application and assessment methods have always been the responsibility of the panel the code's being revised, and my suggestion is that ultimately um, it's the chair of the panel on behalf of the Scottish ministers who is responsible, really, for ensuring that the, every appointment round delivers. We expect them to design application and assessment methods that are going to meet the objective. And the revised code talks about an individual plan mm -hmm. that the chair of the panel is responsible for writing, saying, these are the methods that I am going to use and this is why I'm going to use them, because I know it's going to deliver. And then at the end of that appointment round, basically to say whether or not they've been successful. And, and that revision will fundamentally make a difference. So, so by creating that standard or creating that template uh, that you're putting together, that will then give them the opportunity uh, to develop that. But is there also the opportunity for things to be expanded within different boards when they're looking for different people? Uh, because they say if, if the criteria is too rigid and people don't fulfil the criteria, they're bound to fail. But if the, if the criteria is widened and people can feel that there's a, a, a bigger opportunity to develop that, that may encourage more people to progress. Oh, absolutely. Um, but we need to take a step back there because that's a ministerial responsibility. So the minister says, this is what I need for that board. And sometimes it will be quite narrow and sometimes it will be 
very wide and it really does depend on what you're looking for. Um, let's say an NHS board is looking for um, someone who has experience of accessing the services from the perspective, you know, let's say of someone who's underprivileged or someone who um, faces barriers in terms of health care, then you're going to be looking at a wider pool than when you're looking for the chair of an audit committee. Inevitably, that doesn't mean that, you know, these are different classes of board members. They absolutely are not. You know, they, they both have a really important contribution to make to the thinking of the board overall. But that's a ministerial responsibility. Once the minister has said, that's what I want, it's then incumbent on the chair of the panel to adopt good practice and to use methods that are suitable for those people. So, um, given the examples that I've just used, and, and we have, and have had for years, good practice advice on our website about all the, the, the different range of things that panels potentially can do. But quite often it's easier because of resource constraints, time constraints, just to go down the tram lines. This is what we did the last time. So, you know, we are trying to, again, just be transparent about, look, these are your decisions to make, but they will have an impact. But if you were looking for the chair of an audit committee, what will you do? You, you, so how would you assess? You give them a balance sheet. <laughs> you know, you, uh, you present them with a board paper that's directly relevant to that role, and you get them to give an assessment of it. Um, fine. Uh, if, it, if it's someone from the other background, you know, that, that user background, then you want to make it as accessible as possible. And that might not be about an application form at all. You know, the code doesn't require an application form. We need to gather your demographic data. And we, you know, we need to know where you are. But, but it could be a wee letter just, you know, describing yourself and, and your experience of accessing healthcare. And you know, that's absolutely fine. That's what the code anticipates, whether or not it happens all the time. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you, Convener. Oh, thank you. And uh, we're going to swap hats slightly now. Um, <coughs> the other piece of evidence we'd like to hear from you is in relation to the strategic plan that you've got for 2021 through to 2024. Um, and we've had the benefit of looking at it. And again, the members have questions, but I was going to take the privilege of convener and kick off and really just ask for an explanation. Um, the, the word case and complaint um, is used a lot. Can you explain the difference between or give the definition of what is a complaint for the purposes of the numerology that we see in these reports and how does that become a case? Yes. Um, I, I'm working on the assumption that we're talking about MSP complaints and cases. Um, although although the, the same, the way in which we operate applies very similarly in, in relation to board member complaints and, and those relating to councillors. Um, a complaint is a single complaint from a single complainer about a single member. A case is where multiple complaints may have been made against a single member or potentially in some cases multiple complaints made about multiple members. And where those share similarities, they, we group them together into a case and deal with them as a case. So that, and it's about uh, it's about us being consistent as an office. Everyone deserves us to act consistently. And if lots of people have made a complaint about a particular instance, a particular type of conduct that is of concern to them, then we will put them all in into the same case and the member will know because that's the obligation under the act is we'll let them know the, the names of those who've complained and the nature of those complaints and, and we group them together if, if the complaints are all very similar so that's the way it works I, i'm not going to talk to our annual report which is yet to be laid but I can talk to last year's one, if that yes. helps, just to it, give you an example. It would. I mean, just to, to clarify in my own mind, in essence, a complaint is when someone corresponds with you about an event that they wish to complain about. Indeed. And then, in some circumstances, that will become a case in its own right as a one-off, and there will be a response made by 
whoever the allegation is made against. But there are occasions where there are a number of different complaints, perhaps from a number of different sources, where for the purposes of reaching an equitable uh, and legal conclusion, it would make sense to deal with them together. And that would then become a case. So Precisely. where there are large numbers of complaints and smaller numbers of cases, it's not that things have vanished, it's that they have been brought together for the purposes of justice. Would that be right? Absolutely. Okay. Well, can I just move on then and probably to, to, to help you facilitate, I think, what you intend to do. I mean, there has been an increase in the admissible complaints received by yourself. Um, are you in a position to an express a view as to why you think that's going up? Or what would you like the committee to know from your point of view as to why they're going up? Um, so, I said I was going to give an example from yeah. the last annual report published. Um, so, it looks as though, you know, from the figures, there was a significant rise in complaints. Setting aside cases, I know there was a rise in cases, but, you know, they do fluctuate and... And the numbers are relatively small, so I don't think we can draw conclusions in relation to that annual report. Um, but I handled this particular case, and 76, sorry, excuse me, 67 members of the public all complained about a single tweet made by a member. And <laughs> so, so you can see that, you know, something that's relatively straightforward can lead to, you know, a significant, apparently significant increase in complaints. Uh, generally, though, um, there is a trend, um, and I think it's fair to say this, this applies to not just MSPs, but equally to councillors, in relation to treatment of others, Section 7 of the Code, and that's, that's about how members treat others, um, particularly the respect provisions. Uh, I, I am not convinced that there's a significant rise in terms of admissibility at this point in time. So, and, and you've asked what are the reasons behind that. Um, I think for the last year and a half, people have had a lot of time on their hands. And there is an exponential rise in the way in which members engage with the public via social media. And I think these, these are important factors that... that the members may want to take into consideration. So it's not a simple process of things are getting worse. It's more complex than that. There are more nuances in it. But I do think it is interesting that you've seen a rise in the view that people have of the respect that, in essence, citizens are showing each other within this place, within councils and elsewhere. Um, do you think the figures are... Um, sufficient to make a strong conclusion that that's where it's going, or do we need more time? Um, I think a little more time, but not a great deal. Um, I am monitoring that situation very closely, and as members will be aware from the strategic plan, I have staffed yes. up yes. because because I don't anticipate uh, diminution based on what I know no. at the moment. Thank you. Paul, are you right to... Yeah, Ian, th thanks for that. And I, th I think it's just maybe a, l a little bit more in discussion and questions around about this. Obviously, change to the code has been in place since late 2019, and but the revised act only passed eh, last year. And I think you kind of touched on it and saying around about, you know, did the, the changes to the act result in an increase in cases, which you kind of touched on? I, I think probably the question I'm trying to get to is, the, 20, the, the 2021 act, do you think that's going to uh, result in a further increase? And the number of ca uh, cases? Uh, potentially. It's, so it's, it's not been my experience that the change in the legislation or the changes in the code have led to the rise. And I think, you know, it's uh, fair to say that. They really haven't. Um, I am not sure what's going to come forward, but it's incumbent on me to prepare for it. And, and that's what I've been doing. And I'm in the process of doing um, I think it would also be fair to say that if cases of this nature, and, and just so that, for the record, so that people are aware of what, what we're talking about, so this is historic um, cases involving sexual harassment by members, potentially, or 
bullying. Um, I think it would be fair to say that if a number of those cases came before us, even if it was a relatively small number, the complexity involved and, um, and the time involved in investigating those properly to a conclusion will be high. Just, uh, just on that, I, I, I take it, no, this might be anecdotally, but when cases, you know, complaints come in, cases come in, is there an understanding from the member of the public who's complaining and they're about the details, or, you know, of, of the act, or is, or is it generally it comes in and you then have to say, right, this refers to code seven, code seven, whatever part of it. So, do they quote that? I'm, I'm just trying to get an understanding. Is, yes. is there a better understanding of the, the code I itself? Or is there just, as you said, maybe because people have had much more time and they're sending in something generally and thinking it's out of order. So I'm trying to get the balance where, there's, you know, where, yes. where that kind of strikes. I would say in the majority of cases, no, the, the public member of the public is not familiar with the code, certainly not familiar with the legislation. Um, and, and we absolutely must be even-handed as an office, but equally, you know, it's it's all about public trust and confidence, and so we, we do enable people to make complaints if, if they've, you know, fallen at the first hurdle, and if they don't understand the Act and the Code, um, and, and that's perfectly understandable because these are quite complex things that, you know, um, the members themselves need to struggle with, but... Um, but, but that's not an issue from my perspective. My, my role is to help them to understand in, in very simple terms whether or not the code, the Act is engaged, and, and if not, why not? Yeah. So I, I take it there's appropriate feedback if there's, a, if there's a case or a complaint that comes through, that there's feedback to why it's not admissible to go any further kind of stuff. So, but Absolutely. Because it does almost get to the point you, you're not wanting facetious uh, complaints coming in. So if there's that feedback to members of the public who understand that, I think, you know, I think that's an important part of the... The service. Absolutely, and to members. Yeah, you know, everyone needs to understand yeah. what the view is, why I've reached the decision that I've reached. That, that's very important, and, and and I go beyond that. So you know, I always add on an offer to discuss the decision if people would find that helpful. And again, that's you know that that's open to complainers and to members. It's important that they understand, and it's important that I'm transparent about my decision-making and, and how the code in the Act is applied. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that. Thank you, Paul. Bob, hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I am going to move on to the line of questioning, but just a, bit, a, a brief reflection. Commissioner, I think you're, you're navigating those questions as a diplomatic core job for you as well as a commissioner's role. Um, but but, but I, I kind of maybe do put it on the record, if you want to reflect on it, that would be interesting, because, I mean, clearly... The Commission for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland should be about making sure the public are aware of your office. They are aware that they can complain to you if they believe those ethical standards have not, not, been, up, not, not been met, and that should be open and transparent and accessible. And the more effectively your office does that, then just the nature of things are that complaints will come in that maybe don't meet the criteria or maybe are. Uh, inspired by an individual tweet, perhaps as a campaign for people to complain about an individual MP or MSP or, or, or whoever. So, I, I mean, I, I think you're in a very difficult position because even if we were to get many, many, many more complaints coming in uh, which were not upheld, uh, that might actually be a success for your office because it means your office is more open, more transparent, more visible and more accessible, even if the complaints coming in are perhaps not uh, of a substantial material nature. So it's interesting your comments on that just before we move on to the next line of questioning. Uh, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. And and part of my reason for bringing forward this, this new strategic plan ahead of what would normally be um, the time that members and others might anticipate such a major change um, is to be much more open and transparent, um, not just here, but but much more broadly uh, in relation to all our stakeholders about the work that we do. To give a really simple example, um, all of our procedures aren't currently in the public domain. I'm having all of those redeveloped, and, and they're all being redeveloped to reflect the way in which I, I require this office to work and, and everyone in this office to work, and it is about accessibility, um, and also consult 
with everyone, all our stakeholders, about those procedures. Are these right? Do you think our KPI, so, you know, do you think our response rates are appropriate? Because if not, I need to know and we'll improve on them. And, and once we've finished that consultation, all of that will end up in the public domain as well. So it doesn't matter who's coming to the office and for what reason, they will know absolutely what to expect and they will be given an opportunity to hold me to account if, if the uh, if the expectations that they have and that we have set out publicly aren't met. I think that's very helpful. I want to put on record that sometimes a significant increase in, in complaints may not necessitate, necessitate there's anything untoward going on with, with uh, uh, elected representatives. It might actually be a success that the office is m more accessible to to those who wish to complain, as difficult as that is for elected representatives. Now, one of the things within the, the draft plan I was pleased to see was there is now going to be a new statement on purposes, uh, values and strategic objectives. Now, I suppose it is stating obvious to say this, this is a good thing, um, but it does maybe beg the question, if this did not exist before, perhaps what was missing before and what added benefit will this give? Um. I think I speak to this in the plan itself. I think what was missing previously in particular. So, yes, I agree. A clear statement of the purpose, a clear statement of objectives, and I think they were there, uh, although they've been revised. Our values weren't on the face of that plan, um, and, and they absolutely had to be included. Um, <laughs> given the nature of the office, people rightly have high expectations about not just what we do, but how we go about it. And, and that had to be on the face of the plan. Um, some things you would anticipate anyway. So we need to act ethically. Um, we need to be responsible in terms of our stewardship of public resources. Um, but, but some things are in there that perhaps wouldn't necessarily have occurred, but, but were absolutely vital to me. And that was about acting with empathy and kindness towards people who come into contact with us. And I apply that to um, members of the public, but, but members also. Um, when people make a complaint or have a complaint made against them, that can be a very hard thing. And, and we've been through a very difficult and challenging period. And it was absolutely vital to me that, that everyone in the office was on the same page. That's, you know, uh, I've just run induction for three new SIOs, uh, sorry, um, investigating officers this week. And that's where I started. Here are objective, but here are our values. You need to act kindly towards people. So, so I, for me, it was really important to get that out there. And in due course, we will ask people on an anonymised basis, is that your experience of coming into contact with our office? And we'll report on that. I think that last bit very helpful. I mean, I don't, I'm kind of inferring some of what you're saying is that the, the purposes, the values and objectives are things that uh, your office may have been doing anyway, but you can't just take that for granted. So it's about putting it out there openly and in the public domain. Uh, I absolutely accept as you expand the staffing team within your office to make sure they're clear that what that is. But I particularly like that last bit about do members of the public feel that you're upholding your purposes, your values, and your strategic objectives. I think that's that's really helpful, and that that was a that was a helpful answer. I, I, know, I see in page five of 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 the report that sets out some key changes that that you would wish to del deliver as well, um, ranging from recruiting and developing staff to ensure consistent, high quality, and a professional skills base. And I think there's six or seven of those. I won't I won't run through them all for time constraints. And the fact that my eyesight probably won't allow me to run through the the, the tiny typing on this this handout that I have, um, but can I can I perhaps maybe ask how you feel these key changes uh, that, that you've set will improve the quality of of the outputs from your office? So you may want to maybe pick one or two of them and just flesh out what differences you think that will make. Yeah. Um, I'll start with staffing, uh, and I need to say thanks to the SPCB for their support with us. I felt that we didn't have sufficient resource in order to move through the complaints that we are receiving um, at a rate that was appropriate 
and took account of the feelings of those who come into contact with us. So I'm talking about complainers, but also members. It's, it's not right that people should have complaints hanging over them simply because our office doesn't have the resource to get through them timeously. So that is absolutely vital to me. Um, and you'll have seen from elsewhere in the plan, staff, that's it. And it's true of most organisations. You know, we, we rent offices, we've got IT equipment, but, um, but in terms of the resources of our office, it's, it's the staff, that's it. And, and they need to be supported. They need to have good work-life balance. I want to be happy in order for them to do the things that we need to do in the way in which we need to do them. So that's absolutely vital. Um, and uh, as I say, the SPCB agreed um, the increase in complement. Our budget bid for next year, which, which will increase, um, goes in soon. And I'm um, hopeful and anticipating support again uh, in order for me to make the changes that I need to make. Um, the other thing and again, I'm going to expand on this a wee bit more, even though I've mentioned it already, is around transparency for our office. So I anticipate, and everything that I'm putting in place, and it's not all covered here, I have you know, an extensive two-year business plan as well that I uh, will provide to the committee in due course once our annual report is published. So, so all the detail is in there. Um, but... Um, so I anticipate that all of those plans will be implemented. I'll be publishing all of that as well, and they will make a difference. But over and above that, I do absolutely plan to consult and then publish on our performance as we go along so that the committee and everyone else can see whether or not we're achieving our objectives, the extent to which we're achieving our objectives. All of that will be in the public domain. Um, and, and it will be much more comprehensive than, than you've seen previously in annual reports. Um, and if I'm not doing the job, then absolutely it's the role of this committee to hold me at account, uh, including others in this parliament. No further questions, Kendra. Thank Th you. Thank, thank you, Bob. Now I'm slightly conscious of time. So, Alexander, would it be all right if I just jump to you? Surely, Convener. The strategic objectives I think that you're putting forward are, are, are really showing that you are attempting to have greater accountability, uh, transparency, and even stakeholder engagement. Uh, and, and that is welcome because that's what we want to see uh, in the way that people can actually feel that they are able to engage and, and have all that. Uh, but if we are trying to have that, that meaningful uh, relationship how are you balancing that with your existing resources that you have? Now, you have indicated you've taken on some new roles and some new people, but your budget constraints are still there and your workload is increasing. Uh, so in trying to ensure we do all of that, uh, can I ask you how you've managed to square that circle? Um, so, as I say, I've got agreement for additional staff and, and that... And that was from the SPCB and, and that will have ramifications and, you know, that... that Budgets yet to be approved. Um, we certainly worked um, well within our means in the current year, um, but staff—that's our primary resource. At the end of the day, um, I have a job to do. I intend to do it well, and, and and I anticipate I will have the support of the Parliament in order to do what I need to do. Um, Engagement—that's not a resource-intensive thing necessarily. Um, I'll give you a very simple example of one of the you know small things that I've changed, but we we just changed our Survey Monkey license okay. uh, in order to add additional users. So for public appointments, we've always well for a good long while surveyed applicants for, to allow them the opportunity to provide their views anonymously on the appointments process. So all we're doing is expanding that to cover the work of the office. So people. You know, we'll get a link in future in letters that I send to them. That will include members, it will include complainers, and it will be, you know, like, how, how did you find it? And you can tell us anonymously, and we promise to report on that. Um, and over and above that, I mean, clearly I have a personal responsibility in terms of engagement with our stakeholders, such as um, the Standards Commission for Scotland, COSLA, this committee. Um, and... Um, I'm not going to say I'm cheap, <laughs> but, but I'm you know, more than happy to dedicate my time to this sort of activity because I see the importance of it. 
and, and it's about avoiding this concept of a tick box exercise uh, just by going through the motions or going through the process. Uh, and even the, the current pandemic situation has meant that staff are not able to meet as they would have normally in an office environment. But that hasn't given you any difficulties in managing to fulfil your role and responsibilities and ensuring that you can still have that engagement, you can still have that transparency. Uh, so it would be good to get a feel of how you see that developing. Yes. Um, I just mentioned the induction of the new IOs, and it, you know it's not been straightforward, but staff turnover in our office, I think it's worth saying at this point in time, and, and you'll see it from the annual report when it comes in, has not been good. No. It was 70% um, and the year before last, 60% um, this last year. Um, and do you think that's pressure of work or the, just the environment you're in? A number of factors, but um, I've, <laughs> I've been acting commissioner since mm -hmm. 20th April. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I saw what needed to be done and I had a number of recommendations from auditors, which I welcome about what needed to be done with the office and, and these are the things that I am putting in place. But staff are absolutely Fine. pivotal to that and and the way in which I engage with them, um, I think they appreciate, they'll, they'll be the judge of that, you know, they may vote with their feet, but it is about, look, you know, we have these values. This is us as an office yeah. and, and everyone had to sign up to that and, and no one who came forward for any of the new roles w was in any doubt that that's what the expectation is and I think we're all on the same page and I think we're all really dedicated and looking forward to our time working together ahead. Okay, thank you convener. Thank you very much um, and really I suppose I'm going to push time wise for a yes no answer on this. Um, there are clearly changes in the way that you're reporting with the contents of the annual reports and also the publication of your minutes. We're not going to lose any information that's previously been reported that won't make um, trends trackable over a period of time? Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, I've instructed an audit this year um, covering the last two annual reports um, to ensure that information that wasn't in those, that was in prior ones, has been reinstated. Yeah. Uh, and I need to say as well, sorry, I know you asked for a yes, no, no, no. answer, but I just yeah, I no. want the committee to be aware of this. Anything that the committee feels that should be in the public domain and would be useful for the committee or the public to see, the committee need only ask, and I will ensure that that's done, subject to, um, obviously, the restrictions placed on me by the legislation. I'm, v I'm very grateful for that, that. I would say kind offer, but I think from listening to your evidence today, the sort of offer that we expect and can expect so. Um, can I thank you for your time um, as Acting Commissioner coming in today on a slightly dreek day and for your evidence. Um, and as always, on behalf of the committee, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. We now move, um, committee, to agenda item three, which is in relation to the cross-party groups. Um, we're being asked to consider a change of purpose for the proposed cross-party group on independent convenience stores. Section 6, paragraph 40 of the Code requires that any proposal to change the purpose of a group must be drawn to the attention of the committee and that the committee can then decide whether the group should be accorded recognition. Paragraph 6 of the papers, uh, of our paper set sets out the purpose of the group and in session five and the paragraph seven sets out the new proposed purpose. So there's been a change and I'm very grateful to Gordon MacDonald, who's the convener of the proposed group, who's provided an explanation for the change and that is set out in page eight of the papers. Um, just before I invite comments on this, I did want to float a, um, a challenge that I see developing. What's happened is that this cross-party group has stated in part of its purposes a fact about um, various things and those facts have now changed. As a result of that, and rightly so, um, the convener has written to us to say that this has changed and therefore it needs to come back before the committee. And one of the things that I think would be beneficial to discuss going forward is whether or not we give more guidance on 
um, that aspect of it to prevent changes in fact, be it the number of people who visit an area, be it produce landed at somewhere, um, be it maybe even a style of fashion, as that changes whether or not that is something that should come back before this committee or whether or not the purpose of a cross-party group should be um, at a higher level um, to discuss the reasons that the MSPs have formed it. So, can I invite any comments on the application that sits before, uh, before us on the change of purpose? Uh, I'll take Paul and then I'll come to you, Bob. Paul. Yeah, Chair, I suppose it's get, probably getting guidance from the clerk as well. I, I attended the first CPG on, on independence doors, um, not as an office bearer, wasn't an office bearer, arrived at the meeting late, wasn't party to the discussions. So it's probably taking a view as to whether I should take part in this discussion, first of all. Um, just to want to check that. And I, and I think the second point before we get on to that is obviously is, is, is our, role, our own role. And, and CPGs will all be involved in various CPGs, maybe as members, maybe as conveners. And again, it's, I think, for clarity and openness and transparency of the committee here, I think it would be good to dis discuss that going forward in terms of our own positions as either conveners, vice conveners or, or members. And just guidance o on that as well, if that would be okay. So. Absolutely. Um, maybe, and having spoken to the, to the clerk, um, from my own point of view, merely as convener, I have indicated to a number of CBGs that I will not take part simply because of this role. That's not a requirement. That's just something that I feel would be beneficial so that CPGs understand that there's an evenness. Attendance and membership of a CPG by any member of this committee is perfectly fine. Um, I think it's good practice to point out exactly as you've done, Paul, where there's a specific intent of something that's before us, but it certainly wouldn't preclude um, your involvement in the discussion. Okay, so thank, thank you for that. Thank you. thank you. Bob, can I come to you? Yep, yeah. thank you, Convener. I think uh, you make a very important point about putting statistics or data that, or facts that, that change over time into the purpose of a cross-party group. And, uh, God McDonald was quite right to uh, draw that to our attention to seek permission to, to change that purpose. I, I'm just noting that in changing that purpose, it notes that the sector employs 47,000 people. It has sales of £4 billion, and the sector corporates £530 million in GVA to Scotland's economy per annum. Now, I'm delighted to put that on the record for, for my, my, my colleague uh, Gordon MacDonald, but I suppose that's also a snapshot at time. What will it be in? What if a new report comes out and um, that data changes? I'm just wondering whether or not, if we are going to that kind of data within the purpose of a cross party group, if, if, if that's what happens, whether there should be a reference to what, uh, the, the nature of those figures, because that could be from one year ago, it could be from two years ago, it could be from a report last week. I have no idea. So, as soon as we approve this, and I think we should approve this, um, that may itself become out of date. The second thing is procedurally, where um, if such things have been put in the purpose of a cross-party group, uh, if, if the statistical data does change and they wish to keep that within the purpose of the cross-party group, in this case, I get that to draw the importance of the sector to, to Parliament quite clearly up front. And that, that, that I get why they would wish to do that. Uh, perhaps, uh, rather than having this as a formal agenda item, we could simply and note those changes, and it could be a procedural change rather than being a formal agenda item. But I'm not sure the processes around that. So hopefully, those two points are helpful. That, that's that's very helpful, very helpful, Bob. What what I would say, the only thought that process that I've got pushing this forward, is in relation to the fact it is a resource um, draw, a very heavy resource draw on the committee's resources monitoring and guiding these and you know i echo your thanks to gordon in respect of this and i just wonder whether there is not a a, a a better process by which we can have a purpose of a cpg plus obviously the requirements that a lot of cpgs have about um you know calling out from the highest possible mountain the benefits of that group alexander thank you convener i think uh with specifics to this group itself i think it's only right and proper that there is the change, and I, and I would concur and I would accept that. Uh, I think you make a very valid point, Convener, about the, the resource and timescale that we have. There are a large number of cross-party groups, 
uh, and they are quite diverse in their roles, responsibilities, and also their curriculum activity that they may would get involved in, depending on the topic. Uh, and I think that it would be good best practice if we do have some kind of structure that we don't have a tsunami effect on the, the, the committee clerks and the, and the officials within uh, this committee of having to manage that. Uh, but if we can try and tailor the, the structure so that there is a, 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 a design or a, a, a formulation that's put in place that, that helps the CPG, but also helps the committee and the officials to manage that process. Because I, I am very aware that they, they put a lot of effort into all of this, uh, and we cannot uh, uh, have them being, oh, uh, as I say, engulfed uh, with these. We've got hundreds of CPGs uh, in reality, and if they all did this, uh, you would spend your complete uh, working life dealing with it, and that cannot be the case. Absolutely, and I, I, I very succinctly put, Alexander. Um, can I see whether there's any suggestion from any of the members that there is a desire not to allow this CPG to re-register? Then I see nothing, so I'm going to formally ask, do members agree that the CPG on independent convenience stores still be accorded recognition with the new purpose? And we're agreed on that. Thank you. Oh, my apologies, Edward. Um. Sorry, no, uh, convener, I, I do definitely agree, and I'm not going to disagree. I just make the general point on cross-party groups. It is a way to get people to involve themselves in the Scottish Parliament and to uh, become involved in what the Scottish Parliament does. So it is very difficult for us to ever say no to it. So I'm with Alexander uh, in a formulaic process to, to allow them to continue, because it would only be in very exceptional circumstances, in my mind, that we should stop people engaging with the Parliament, which I think is our priority and the priority of all parliamentarians. Thank you, Edward. Well, on that point, we move um, to the next agenda item, which the committee have agreed to take in private. So I call an end to the public element of this committee. Thank you.